In the previous lecture, we talked about how a mutex is like a key at a coffee shop that can be used to unlock and lock a shared restroom. Much like a mutex, a semaphore is used to protect shared resources. However, a semaphore can count to numbers greater than one. So if we were to extrapolate the coffee shop analogy to semaphores, it would be like saying there are multiple restrooms and a bucket of keys that worked on any of the restroom doors. However, this analogy does not work. Even if you obtained a key to unlock any of the restroom doors, how would you know if any one of them is occupied? You'd still need another protection mechanism, like unique mutexes, to protect the individual restrooms. Let's talk about how semaphores work and how they can be used effectively. In a lot of literature, you'll often read that a semaphore is a generalization of a mutex, in that it allows multiple threads to enter a critical section instead of just one. While this is technically true, you'll find that you rarely want or need to have multiple threads enter a critical section. Instead, semaphores are often better used as a signaling mechanism to other threads that some common resource is ready to be used. Here's the basic idea. A semaphore is much like a lock, but instead of 0 or 1, it can count to some positive number that we set. For example, let's say we have a critical section of code and we only want three tasks to have access to it at a time. So we create a semaphore and set its initial and maximum value to 3. Task A wants to use a shared resource like a global buffer, serial object, and so on. So the task first checks the semaphore. Since the semaphore is greater than zero, task A can take one, which decrements the value. Note that this take function is similar to what we saw with mutexes. Checking the semaphore value and decrementing it must be an atomic operation so that no other tasks can interrupt that action. It then enters the critical section and starts working with the shared resource. Task B comes along and wants to access the critical section as well, so it performs the same procedure. It checks the semaphore, and if the semaphore is over zero, it decrements it by one and allows task B to enter the critical section. Task C comes along and does the same, decrementing the semaphore as it does so. At this point, there are three tasks working in the critical section and the semaphore is now zero. If a fourth task tries to take the semaphore, it will block the task as the semaphore is zero. Just like with a mutex, the task can wait in the block state or go do something else, periodically checking the semaphore. When a task is done with the critical section, it gives the semaphore back, which increases the semaphore count by one. At this point, task D may now take the semaphore, which decreases the value back to zero and enter the critical section. Each time a task is finished working in the critical section, it must call semaphore give to increment the semaphore value to let other tasks into the critical section. This is often how semaphores are taught, and it's great in theory, but it's the same as our multiple shared restrooms analogy. Even in the critical section, how do we protect individual resources from multiple threads? Because of that problem, you'll rarely find that semaphores are used like this. I hope this helps you see how semaphores work, but let's see how they're better used as a way to synchronize threads. You'll normally see semaphores used in a producer-consumer design where one or more tasks add data to a shared resource and one or more tasks remove data from that resource in order to use it. The shared resource is often something like a buffer or a linked list that can grow unbounded. Note that if access to the resource is not atomic, then you'll likely still need to protect it with a mutex in addition to using semaphores to notify the consumers. Whenever a producer task adds something to the buffer, it calls semaphore give, which increases the value of the semaphore by one. You can limit the size of the shared resource by limiting the maximum value of the semaphore. The tasks can check the value of the semaphore, and if it's at its max, it cannot add anything to the buffer. Other tasks may also try to read from the shared resource. These tasks are known as consumers, as values will not only be read, but also removed from the buffer. Each time one of these consumers wishes to access the shared resource, it must first call semaphore take. In this case, the semaphore value is above zero, so the task will be allowed to read and remove a value from the buffer. Note that semaphore take will cause the semaphore to decrement, just as we saw earlier. Other consumer tasks can do this so long as the semaphore is above zero. 
When it reaches zero, tasks will be blocked and prevented from consuming values in the shared resource. With this design, tasks can add and remove values from the shared resource at any time, and the semaphore offers a way to synchronize that reading and writing. Here's the thing, if all this sounds very much like a queue, you're right. Semaphores can often add unneeded complexity in a program and can be very difficult to debug. If you can accomplish something using a queue, you should probably do that instead. Let's review the differences between a mutex and a semaphore. Even though they have similar implementations, they should be used very differently. First, a mutex implies a level of ownership, in that a task claims ownership of the mutex while it is working in a critical section or with a shared resource. No other tasks may take the lock during that time, they must wait their turn. This is similar to our one key for a shared restroom analogy. A semaphore, however, does not imply ownership. Tasks should not give and take the same semaphore. Rather, they should use semaphores to signal to other tasks that some shared resource is ready to be read or consumed. One task increases the semaphore value, and another task decreases it. Second, many implementations of these kernel objects, such as the one in FreeRTOS, include a form of priority inheritance with mutexes, but not with semaphores. Priority inheritance involves automatically raising the priority of tasks that hold mutex locks to prevent a higher priority task from being blocked for a long time. They can help alleviate the nasty bug of priority inversion, which we'll talk about in a later lecture. Note that you can have a binary semaphore, which only counts to one. At first, this may seem like a mutex, but I hope these differences illustrate that a binary semaphore is definitely not the same thing as a mutex. Semaphores, including binary semaphores, are useful in interrupt service routines where you want to signal to other tasks that some data is ready. You do not want to use a mutex in an interrupt service routine as it's bad form to have such a routine be blocked for any amount of time waiting for a resource to free up. Note that giving and taking is not necessarily common terminology in the world of semaphores. For example, POSIX semaphores use post and wait. Make sure you look at the documentation of whatever operating system you are using to learn its unique vocabulary for things. In the last lecture, I asked you to use a mutex to cause the setup function to wait so that parameters could be read while creating tasks. As I had mentioned, that was a bit of a hack, as it was not a great use of a mutex. However, it proves to be a perfect use case for a binary semaphore. Instead of using a mutex, let's create a binary semaphore. Note that a binary semaphore will be initialized to zero, which means we don't have to take it before creating our task. In our task, we copy our parameter and then call xSemaphoreGive to add one to the semaphore. Back in setup, we call xSemaphoreTake just like we would for a mutex. This will block the setup function from exiting until the parameter has been read. Let's run this and check the output. In the serial terminal, we can enter a number when asked, and that number gets passed to the blink task. A semaphore is a much cleaner and nicer way to signal to other tasks than using a mutex. The free RTOS documentation still recommends not using stack memory to pass values to tasks in this manner, but it works. Let's expand this to a counting semaphore demo. We'll start with some base code that creates five tasks. All five tasks call this same task function, which copies the contents of the parameter to a local message struct and then prints out the contents of the body and length members. Just before creating a common message to pass to all tasks, I'll create a counting semaphore with a maximum limit of 5, equal to my number of tasks and an initial value of 0. Then I'll run a simple for loop which generates a unique name for each task and then creates the task. Note that it passes to the task a pointer to my message. Just like before, each task copies the struct to a local variable and then increments the semaphore. It then immediately prints out the contents of the struct, waits for a second, and then deletes itself. In setup, we take back all five counts of the semaphore by putting the xSemaphore take function in a for loop that executes five times. Once the semaphore equals zero, it means that all tasks have copied the struct from stack memory and the setup function can safely return. From there, we just loop forever. Let's upload and run this demo. You should see the argument printed out five times. Notice that some of the output might overlap each other and that's because we didn't protect the serial port as a shared resource. If you'd like a bonus challenge for this episode, I encourage you to try treating the serial.print statements as a critical section and protect them using a mutex. But now, for your real challenge. 
I'm going to start you off with a program that has five tasks that add values to a shared circular buffer and two tasks that read from this circular buffer. The five tasks that add to the buffer are the producers, and the two tasks that read from it are the consumers. What they share is pretty simple. Each producer task writes its task number to the buffer three times. So you should see zero printed three times, one printed three times, two printed three times, and so on, in no particular order. Your job is to protect this circular buffer using mutexes and semaphores. Note that you will need two separate counting semaphores here in addition to the mutex, one to count the number of filled slots and the other to count the number of empty slots in the buffer. Here is the starting code. I'll make sure there's a link to it in the description. The producer threads copy in their thread number from the parameter and then write that number to the circular buffer three times. The consumer threads simply print out anything they find in the buffer. Note that I'm using a binary semaphore to pass in unique parameters to each producer thread. This does not count as one of your semaphores. If I run this, you'll see that the output values start to overlap each other because there's no protection of the serial port, and it runs forever, as there's nothing telling the consumer threads to stop reading from the buffer. If you do this right, you should see the integers 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 each printed to the terminal three times in no particular order, and then stop. Do this first with semaphores, and then try it again with queues to see if it's any easier. You'll only need a few lines of code to control the semaphores and mutex, but it can be tricky to figure out where to place them. Good luck on this challenge. On the next episode, we'll talk about how you can use software timers to delay calling a function.